we'll go with it because um, it seems official. <laughs> okay, so we are Melon in Minds. Um, my name is Legina and this is Mel, and we are on a art and mental health road trip. Uh, we just filed our 501c3 paperwork. Um, thank you, thank you, two days ago. And we are here with uh, our traveling health and wellness um, self care Sunday um, massage therapist, Alexis. Mm -hmm. And so on Sunday, there's an opportunity to get um, chair massages. I think she's doing 15 minutes. Um, her, her blessing is touch. So she, she's been coming around and helping us with that. And she traveled here from Houston, Texas. And then we also have our first official board member here with us. Um, she's actually at a Black Fine Arts Month, um, one of the other events hosted by uh, Pigment Magazine. We all know Pigment. Got it right here next to us. Shout out to Pigment. Uh, they opened up their resources and love to help us get this space. Um, we have artists, please come in, hi. We have artist um, Blake, A. London, or Angelica, I still call her A. London, um, right here, and their pieces are around. And our only deal with the artists is to make sure that they were comfortable talking about their mental health. Because we all know that art um, is of our culture and of our people, and we, we exert our feelings and our emotions, and the times are reflected in our art, as you see in this room tonight. Um, Mel's going to talk really quick about uh, Melanin Minds and our pillars and our missions, and then we're going to bring Blake up, and we're going to have like a really open, transparent conversation about, uh, you know, black men, men of color, and mental health, and his art journey, and then he also has a really cool nonprofit um, around, you know, south side of Chicago, like in some places of the country, um, in white-centric media, this... Uh, this beautiful city is uh, demonized, mm -hmm. and <laughs> that ain't it. <laughs> that is not it. Um, my sister went to Northwestern Law here, um, and that was where I first got my love of Chicago, and I have been traveling solo here. It's one of the only places I travel solo all over the world, and I love it. Um, Dana Todd Pope, she's one of the artists here, and um, I met her over the pandemic through Black Girl Ventures, and she opened up her art community to uh, me and all of us to make this happen. So we're really excited to be here. Thank you for the support. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Mel. She can tell us more about Mel and Mind. Thank you. Thanks for coming through, y'all. Um, so yes, Mel and Mind is a 501c3 in progress. We are um, aiming to create spaces where BIPOC communities can thrive and really develop professionally and personally. Um, and we do that around five key pillars to mental health, which is relationships, nutrition, aligning, mindset shifting, and holistic healing. So underneath all five of those pillars, you know, we can really touch on any kind of topic, right? Financial, wealth, uh, health and wellness, um, and of course art, because art is definitely involved in holistic healing and mindset shifting, even aligning, right? Um, aligning yourself and, and your journey. So we're really excited to be here. Um, we hosted two mental health conferences out of Houston, and we'll be doing that every year. Um, so look out for the dates for 2023. And this year, we decided after our conference to hit the road. Um, I'm based out of Los Angeles. Uh, Legina's based out of Houston. Um, so I was like, hey, come to LA. We'll do an event there. Um, actually, no, you were like already planning in Chicago. I was nervous. I saw, the drive, <laughs> I saw the file in the drive, in the Google Drive. I was like, oh, Chicago? Well, let's do LA too. <laughs> By the time she told me about LA, I've seen it. We, we got an LA event coming too. Um, so LA was our first stop. Uh, we had a, another three-day weekend. Um, we had uh, two small business marketplaces because it was also to celebrate the only app second year in app stores, which is an app, a uh, directory app for women and minority-owned small businesses. So founded had, by yes, founded by me. Um, we had a ton of black and brown businesses in the building, everything from cosmetics, waist beads, self-care journals. And then on Sunday, as we like to theme around self-care, we had a sit shop and paint market where Regina got to get really hands-on and teach different painting techniques. So when it came to Chicago, we know we wanted to do another three-day weekend. Um, and we are here for our preview night. We'll be here tomorrow as well. Um, and on Sunday for our community resource day, where we'll have some more pigment magazines and some fun things for kids to check out as well. Now that's it. Okay. So without further ado, we're going to bring up Blake, and we're going to do chair swaps. Wow. 
like so, but if I have a earring on the side, <laughs> I really want it to show. <laughs> Wait, you don't drink anything? Do you need wine? Oh, no. Okay. All right, y'all. So the goal for this entire weekend is to talk about mental health and as it pertains to our art. So I'm going to have Blake first introduce himself, and then I have like a notebook full of fun questions. Um, Blake has been one of our, we like to give uh, vendors and different people we're working with stars. Blake is one of our stars because he filled out all his paperwork first. <laughs> and then we're celebrating him even more because, you know, in, in these spaces, uh, Black men get demonized, right? Um, and sometimes the focus is different or the understanding for doing business is different. And Blake's on top of it, he's on point, and he's very big at accrediting different people and showing love in the art community here in Chicago. So Blake, I'd love for you to introduce yourself, talk a little bit um, about you know when you started art, and uh, we'll dive in there. Well, hello everybody, uh, good evening. I'm glad everybody's here today. Ah, man, how about that tracker? <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Blake Moore. I'm from the south side of Chicago. Born and raised, uh, Auburn Gresham to east of the lake. Uh, yeah, pretty much been a little bit of everywhere. Uh, neighborhood kid, for sure. Uh, came up as an athlete primarily in my family, a basketball player, basketball family. Uh, was very reclusive. I uh, was always bigger than everybody, so I never really got to do too much of the kid play play stuff. So I was like, I gotta find something else to do to stay out of trouble. Because I can't do the two, three year younger me stuff. So I can't jump in the bed, flip, and fall. I'm knocking all the stuff. So I took to drawing. And at, as early as two years old, my mother uh, told me that I started trying to uh, literally draw every feather on a duck that I was attempting to draw. And that was her first uh, recognizing of me having that. I for detail. And from there, it kind of blew up. Uh, but primarily, it started as just a sitting in the classroom in the corner and drawing. Uh, let's do a couple of anime characters here. Let's do a draw a kid in the classroom and see how he's sitting at his desk. And I just stuck to drawing uh, primarily. Went to college for drawing. Uh, got my degree in fine art where I didn't know my direct lane that I wanted to go into. So I was kind of just. Uh, playing the field and kind of stick to what I knew, and didn't really take too many mediums to experiment, didn't paint, I literally didn't paint at all in college. Wow. You wouldn't believe it, exactly. The old it's on the face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it was something else. It was a blessing and a curse. It was a blessing because it allowed me to be authentic when I felt that I wanted to paint to get to the medium, but it also got me to a point where it allowed my expressions to just explode into a whole new level. Mm -hmm. So from just 2D drawings of people, I always wanted to just draw uh, figurative things or uh, trees and scenic, scenic uh, things. From that to, I need to illustrate my brain. Something needs to come out of here. I don't, this is not fulfilling anymore. It's not, I don't see what I think out anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this has to, this has to bust out some type of way. So I went to the university, uh, bookstore and they had a little starter set with like little uh, pastels and uh, acrylic paints. Mm -hmm. Went home <laughs> and just had a little fun just squirting paint in here and everywhere and I was like let me look up some black artists. First guy I came across was uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat of course. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the kings that allowed me to unlock my brain of the stigma of doing it a, a right way yes. or a certain way that would be respected. And from him, uh, wanted to know more about my home skill in uh, drawing and graphite. I looked into Charles White's work, mm -hmm. and I was blown away. I was like, this is, wow, this feels like home. This is exactly, uh, in black art, the perception of, or how I look, at, uh, I guess in a surrealistic take, mm -hmm. on how he uh, enlarged limbs, or how, however he highlighted uh, elements of black waves of emotions, or cultural norms obscure. or it's it's very obscure. And to go to this uh, TED talk that he had with uh, this is name. Uh, uh, James Perry Marshall. James Perry mm -hmm. Marshall artist he spoke on Charles White. And once he told the story of him in college and how he was uh, in his studio and just kind of I was like this is it. This is the inspiration into fine art that I wanted not to be told that oh you paint like Picasso or you paint like this guy. You do like the like okay that's cool but 
whatever. Like, that's, I don't know who that is. I don't know what that means. I, that's not a compliment to me as a kid coming up, as a, as a black kid coming up yeah. as a career. You know, none of their work speaks to me. I was actually uh, an a-hole in, in art history because I used <laughs> to always speak on them. Uh, they used to oh, this is a composition of shapes and colors by so-and-so. And he -so, was thinking this. I'm like, nah, that's squares and circles. And you coming in and telling me that you play with the depth of it, and that means all of this, no. No. <laughs> nice to be, hey, excuse me, can I ask you a question? <laughs> so yeah, uh, art history and college kind of oh, also opened up my brain to knowing that I tailored my own story in art history. Mm -hmm. So to be a black artist with a voice and to be unapologetic about my perspective on what I view as art, instead of fall into the canon of art and just get washed out yeah. as, a, as a black art. So being exhausted from trying to uh, meet these European standards that aren't meant for me to yes. uh, meet. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So to, like you see in some of my work, I have elements of those crafts, but it's to put forth black uh, narratives, black uh, images, uh, black uh, pride, black Optimism, black futurism, black everything, everything beautiful about us. And even the not so beautiful, highlighting that in ways that empower us to talk about what we're going through. So that in mental health is what a lot of my art comes from. Uh, I, I've seen a lot. I've always, like I said, been very reclusive and uh, I guess you could say, uh, what's the word? Um, brain. I've been running around all day, so you have to excuse me. Uh, but very, Observing, I'm sorry, that's the word. Very simple word. Yeah, that's not. Very observing. So very observing. I've noticed people's waves of emotions my whole life, watching my mother, a strong black woman, go and raise me into a black man that I am, and raising nothing but daughters, and seeing all of them thrive and all the things that they do, and me making my dreams come to fruition is only proof that belief in your children gets you to that point, gets them to whatever point they want to get to. Yeah, for sure. When, um, Oh no, does this actually help or should we just do this? Let me see if that noise is. Yeah, no, can y'all hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear. Okay, let's just have a conversation. Um, so, the name of my art brand is My Eye Artistry, mm -hmm. and it literally came from like the story you were telling about like you're looking and you're, you're seeing it, like that's not what I was thinking. And so, it's like my, my own eye and my own art. So when you're talking about this kind of stuff and you talk about European standards and how they're maintained in the art world, mm -hmm. and I think that's going away more and more, especially as we're able to stand in our own truth and these rooms look like us and when we see each other, we acknowledge each other. Like I have gotten so many hugs here in Chicago, but like people say up north, people don't do that in Midwest. And I'm like, okay, we do it in Texas, but everywhere I go, it's being done. Even when I was in Boston, like a whole vibe happened. Um, and so how would you, because it, being an observant person, how would you um, compare your walk in mental health to a, your counterpart, the white man? And I ask that because like when we're looking at stats, it says that 13.4% um, of like uh, black and African American, however you want to identify, um, say that you know, out of that population, of black men in the United States, 16% say they have mental health illnesses. Doesn't sound like a lot, but let me break it down some more. That's seven million men, black men, right? And out of that, that's and this is the cool part, that's more than Chicago, Houston, and Philly combined, right? So when you break it down like that, y'all city, where I'm from, where she's from back there, are black men saying they have mental health illnesses. And so let's not, De let's not take apart from the stigma of all of us that are still um, battling with family members that are like, that's that's for crazy folks. You ain't crazy. Suck it up, right? But you know, even part of even part of Melanin Minds, one thing that's really important for us is to talk about the fact that even though you know in our community maybe traditionally, right, or generations ago that was a thing. Look at this room. Look at us, right? We're sitting here talking about mental health, so we do talk about mental health. And we do it well. Like no one in minds, we've had two conferences and mostly lit, led by black women. Um, massage therapists, touch therapy. We've had people that have 30 degrees, right? Health and wellness coaches, all running um, the panels. 
the interactive things, felons, our black men that are felons. We're like, okay, well, whatever your felony was, what's your mental health journey? Sit here and talk to us because we see past that. So when you're looking at that and you think of um, your walk as a black man mm -hmm. versus, not versus, but in comparison and observance to a white man, where do you think the differentiation is? One is the biggest that you mentioned already. We have to prove to everybody that there's something wrong with us first. Mm. Instead of like this crime, whereas when they say that there's something wrong with them, yeah. it's automatically believed, resources are thrown, they, yeah, people are going to destitute to help them. Yeah. Whereas with us, it's like, please, please, okay, now I gotta be violent. Thank you. Now, yeah. Like, now, oh, now yeah. you hear me. Now it's something wrong. Now it's or you, yeah. or yeah. Let, let, let's, let's shoot him. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Um, and it's even in, you know, when you think about the opioid crisis. <laughs> The opioid crisis is a crisis because in you know middle white America, white women are struggling with that. But crack is only whack. Like that's as far as we got with crack. So it's really interesting when you say that it's about the proving. Um, and so we have storytelling time. So I want you to tell us a story of um, something that you were supposed to get over as a black man and that you struggled with um, mentally. And I tell the story of my little brother. Grew up in San Angelo, Texas, after my mom retired from the military. Shout out to my mother for increasing our generational knowledge and wealth. Yeah. Um, but you know, we grew up in San Angelo, Texas for the most part. And we grew up on, I guess, what would be considered the white side of town, right? It was nice, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever. And my brother's driving home one day, he's in high school, I'm in college at the time, and he gets pulled over. And the turnoff was right in front of our house. So he pulls up in front of our house. And he gives his ID, and the cop looks at the house. The cop looks at him, looks at the house, and he goes, you don't live here. Okay, government-issued ID, right? Like, not expired, tags are good, da, da, da. The fact that I even have to give those caveats is annoying. And so he's like, get out of the car. My brother gets out of the car. My dad comes out of the house. I'll tell you a little bit more in a second, but my dad comes out of the house, and he's like, hey, what's going on? Oh, hi, Mr. Harris. Son, get inside. Mm. My brother, you know, he leaves the car running, goes inside like he's supposed to be. Parents say, put your head down, go inside. Now, the, the back story is, it's a good thing that my parents were in the school district and one of the predominant black families in the city mm. for years because who knows what would have happened with a, a young black man. And, you know, I could say, oh, he wasn't playing his music loud. He had his seatbelt on. But does that actually matter, right? Right. Yeah, all that stuff. Um, the house, like, can he just be accredited by the house? The house is nice. It's brick, you know, it's right across from the mall. He's not driving a hoopty. If all these things matter, right? But the only thing that was seen is that he's a black kid mm -hmm. and probably not in a neighborhood he's supposed to be in. Right. Um, and, and even to this day, when I'm talking to him about it, it, it messes with him. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, and he's even had people say, well, you were just pulled over and your dad came out, uh, you know? So, story time. Like, tell us a story um, because we want you to be heard and share in the moment because that's part of the healing. So, it's actually a very almost exact situation. I was in front of my own apartment building. I left my keys inside. So, I was, ironically, I had uh, the remote to my car, which was like a, I don't know how I had the remote, but didn't have the keys, but mm -hmm. I did. So, I got into the car, I sat there, I'm like, okay, I just gotta wait until somebody comes to bring me. Keys so I can get back in, so I can go upstairs and pretty much start my day over. Yeah. Similar to what happened today. So, <laughs> so yeah, okay. I'll tell y'all about that later. So, I sit in my car, I'm just waiting to call my girlfriend. She's like, okay, I'm gonna take an Uber, come on over there. I'm like, okay, perfect, thanks. I'm sitting in my car, this blacked out uh, SUV comes out the alley, and these guys jump out, guns drawn, with vests on, the whole nine, like, uh, the, like, SWAT, SWAT yeah, yeah. pointing guns at the crowd, like, Please, sir, get your hands out of the bag. We got a call from the people in front of this building that there's a suspicious uh, gentleman in a black car with a book bag, and he looks like he's doing something that he shouldn't be doing. Um, How long did you live there? Uh, recently, what, three years at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and Thousand all of my months. neighbors knew me, so it was really the the business on the corner that reported me, mm -hmm. the people that lived in the building. So I'm waiting, and I, I'm like, okay, freeze for a second. Thing. Okay, I'm like, I'm gonna let the window down. So I let the window down. He was like, Can you get your ID out? Get my ID out. I show it to him. He's like, And at this point, I didn't get my ID changed to my address yet because I just got over there. COVID, 
all these things. Strike number one, Blake. <laughs> Should have done that. <laughs> uh, exactly. So my address said South Island. I'm actually shaking because I was terrified in this moment. Yeah. Uh, he was like, oh, you kind of far from home, aren't you? I don't know. Uh, what, the, oh, what, what does that mean? That was the first question they asked you? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, he kind of says, 1920, South Island. No, he kind of kind of far from home, aren't you? I don't know. Actually, no, I, I live in this building right here. So the address doesn't say that. I'm COVID, and I've been to the DMV yet. I'm sorry, my ID is still valid. He was like, but you need to lose the attitude. We got a call that you were. You need to lose that attitude. I'm losing that attitude. So <laughs> I'm catching myself because I'm like, yeah, don't get excited, Blake. Don't get excited because he, this is, he's trying to evoke a response at me. And these are all minority police. He's a, a Latin guy, an Asian guy. And, all types of yeah. So they just all looking at me like, I'm like, dude, I live here. I'm, I'm not doing nothing. I just left my keys in the house and I'm sitting in my car until my girlfriend pulls up to let me in. He, oh, but we got a call that you look suspicious. Uh, you were in a hoodie and that you were carrying a book bag. You sat in your front seat for too long and you didn't pull off. What if you were a college student? We I'm stay like, in some, and it's Chicago. We stay in this. And y'all feel free to talk back. We we are very interactive at Melanin Minds, so like, we'll open up the floor for questions in one second and comments and stuff. Yeah, so after that went away, he was like, well, do you have another ID for, to show that you prove, to prove that you live here? I'm like, I don't, why do I have to prove that I live where I'm parked in front of and can't get in? He's like, well, you can't get in. So he was trying to argue with me that I was possibly lying about the story that I was putting on keys to so he, he's like, well, we're gonna have to have you get out of the car and you know wait for the wait for your partner to come with the keys and just sit in front of your building. I'm like, oh. So I can't sit in my car until mm -hmm. yeah. I can get in my building. He's like, they're they're suspicious. I'm all right, okay. So I get out, wait till they just drove off and then sat back in my car. Literally 20 minutes later, two more cars pull up behind me. They're like, sir. Uh, we just got a call again that you sat back in your car after the officers left the scene. Yeah. Like literally re-amplifying the whole situation all over again. I went through that for 40 minutes. And then they ran my license. They, oh, you, it looks like you have tickets that you didn't pay. I'm, dude, I'm in front of my place of residence. He's like, we don't, we can't see any proof of that. So again, it was just them nitpicking about me being in the place that I should have been, quote unquote. And this is a neighborhood that is predominantly Polish and Latin ran. So they were definitely being nitpicky. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so again, most of what we're doing, it's important for us to hear these stories, not because it's supposed to frustrate us, but even you being like, oh, same, same story, so that we understand that these things are happening and we as a community can hear and support. Mm -hmm. So like, how does that play into your now? Uh, my now, it plays more into a, uh, a, not, a more subconscious way to not be viewed like I'm a threat, which is crazy because I'm, I'm exactly, there's nothing that I can do about that. Mm -hmm. Most of the times I'm way taller or bigger than the guys that are pulling me over. They see my voice is aggressive because I'm not high up, like I'm not speaking in a docile right. tone, so it's just always some type of concept. So I'm- Yeah, like a deep tenor voice. Yeah, so yeah. And when I'm- voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I pretty much just take, pull back a lot and just try to keep myself from any type of interactions with them. When I do speak to them, I keep it real short and sweet. You know, allow too much uh, personality searching, as you will. And keeping my son aware, you know, even as a two year old, just like relax, like keeping him level headed and right. teaching him to be more level headed than I am. Cause Moments like that, it's hard for me to keep my mouth shut because I come from a speak up family. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I hear y'all, but I, I, I mean, yeah, I'm like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Real, like, bro, I'm being harassed right yeah. now. This is not a be good. I'm not a child. I'm not, yeah. I look young, and that's another thing that keeps me in, in the light of these situations because I don't look my age. So mm -hmm. when they look at my ID, they're like, oh, this guy's 30 plus. I thought he was like yeah. 19 or 20, 20 something. Yeah. Like, Dude, just because I'm. I'm, you know, You're melanin. Yeah, like it's not so that yeah. So audience, like, how many of y'all have been? You feel like have you been tried at some point in your life? Because the way you look, even though you may be a lot older, and somebody just talks to you crazy in some type of way, just like by show of hands or yeah, like pretty much everybody in the room. Yeah. Okay. 
So um, I want to open up the floor real quick because I want to dive into Black Fatherhood, Black Son in a second. But before we go, uh, any comments or questions that anybody wants to get out? Did you have one? Yeah, go ahead. that's an important fact is to be in these rooms and, and know that we care about each other, right? And, and, and move in those kind of ways. Um, black fatherhood. So it's really cool. I'm 37, right? I am single and I have no kids, uh, right? I can be a unicorn in some spaces. Some people are like, what's wrong with you? You don't want kids? I'm on a journey. Like whenever it happens, it does. We can freeze eggs. I can adopt because I like to tell people that um, black kids are the, in America are the number one unwanted adopted thing in the entire world. People go outside of the country to adopt black to bring it back because it's so hard and the systematic things here make it hard to adopt our own children. And, um, and so I say all that to say is because my new thing is I love, I've always dated only black men and it's not because I'm racist because I've had that question too. Um, it's because I feel my kings and it's like my earth thing and I love it. Um, and my new thing is I love like single dads, like dads, black men. There's a lot of black men that are showing up and they are fathers. And, you know, whether it's because of incarceration for marijuana that now is thriving in most cities with white owners or whatever it is. Um, but black fathers go through very, very unique struggles. Very unique struggles. Not saying the black mothers don't, because we see all y'all out there holding it down for the world, the world, the original. Um, but black fathers get stigmatized in a way, right? <laughs> and my favorite comment from Blake this whole time, like he's like my new bestie, um, and like the Chicago art community, y'all are my people. But he said, He's like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. I'm like, hey, you want to do a live tomorrow night? Yeah, sure, I'll do it. And he's like, um, guarantee my son's going to cameo. And I'm like, bet. Like, one, one of our things, one of the things I always talk about, I'm the founder of the Us Space, which is intentional innovation spaces for women of color and women-centric organizations. The first thing I say, um, you know, kid will run across the screen or you're screaming or something, and I'm so sorry. I'm like, fuck that, don't be sorry. Like, it's a kid. 
And you know, the seen and heard thing is important to teach your kids in certain moments, right? Like teaching them to say, excuse me, and stand still and wait. My nephew Dean still doesn't do the wait part. He's like, excuse me, okay, so check one. And then he's like, I'm like, wait. Um, but, and it, it's one of those things that your journey is unique. And I wanna acknowledge I won. Um, I'm not going to thank you for being a parent because, you know, then I have to thank every mother in the room. So let's do that. Thank you, parents. Appreciate y'all. What you're doing, raising our black children and keeping them grounded and, you know, productive members of society. Tell them to fuck that shit. That's what I say. Right. In a good way. Um, but, yeah, tell us about that fatherhood journey because you spoke about teaching your child to be calm. And I see my big brother doing that with my nephew, Dean. He's seven. And there's this um, respect of humans and authority and people that are putting their life on the line with cops, right? Like, not all cops are bad cops. My mom was a cop in the military. So I was taught this, like, respect of them. But it's also um, this discernment about <laughs> who's, who's who, right? And understanding. You can see in people's eyes who they are sometimes. Um, but you were talking about your son. Isn't he, like, two? two. And this journey has already begun. And I don't know a black mother that when she found out she was pregnant with a boy didn't like cry or get fearful. Oh, it's fine. So, so, well, yeah, ironically, that, I had that conversation several times with Tia. Yeah, yeah. speak like, up I, just a little bit for us. I'm sorry, I've had that conversation several times with my lady. She's, she was fearful of bringing our son to, into this world, especially at the time that he, we did, because of all of what we kept seeing. We kept seeing black men vilified and killed for absolutely no reason. And she was in fear of me going to the streets and what I was doing with what I did and how often I was out me not coming home while she was having our child, and also having to tell him why I wasn't home present. So having to go through all of that, and that's just, uh, that's, yeah, therapy right there already. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was definitely a hard conversation to kind of promise her that I would always come home, and to make sure that I would make choices to make sure that that was always going to be the result. Uh, but like you said, the way of teaching my son in that is, a uh, great journey to have because I wasn't taught that from a man. I've actually developed my own sense of manhood from components of men that have been around me my whole life. Uh, my great grandfather, my which was one of the biggest, uh, my great grandfather who passed, uh, my grandfather who just passed. And everybody doesn't have great traits, but sometimes these traits fit you perfectly to mm -hmm. take on. So, exactly. But you can create your own. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I call it finding your yes. yes. And walking through your doors. Come on, finding your yes. <laughs> yes. Good. Did have you um copy business minds people? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yes, find your yes is my my campaign, so you say. I love that. Uh, because coming up as a black kid and a black man, I didn't have too many uh, yeses pointed to me, so I had to keep searching uh, yeah. with, from to coin myself to be uh, dignified, mm -hmm. to be just, to be distinctive. Di dis I'm sorry, distinctive in in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, so raising my son has been amazing because it's allowed me to pull all the layers of me back and to and enjoy the child that I was mm -hmm. and enjoy him and bring him up with that childlike disposition and yeah. all of the things that I wanted to see, uh, the excitements, the joys, the, the support, uh, the love, the, man, I'm almost tearing up. Oh, he's oh, been okay. everything for me. He's been the, the soul healing yeah. mechanism in my life because he's shown me how to be and how it should be done yeah. by yeah. allowing me to be that for him. So uh, yeah, teaching him how to, Manners, like you said, uh, manners, how to be calm, how to keep a calm disposition, even when he's angry or shaken up, or because you don't get your way like that. Yeah, so, yeah. having to show him how that doesn't happen, and like how earlier when he was screaming up the walls in here, I had to <laughs> let him know, like, daddy's working, let me finish, you can scream, but the world does not work this way, the world does not stop because you feel right. the way right now. And my joy in that moment was also that he was screaming for his dad. You know what I mean? Like his mom took it. He was like, ah! like reaching out. Yeah, if I'm in the room, if I'm in the room, it's it's cut your losses. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy could be in the room. His favorite people. It doesn't matter. Daddy is <laughs> the winner. I love it. Yeah. So I I guess 
like, again, we're like really good friends because I always tell people I don't hear no, right? Like I understand what the word no means, um, but like the winner mentality that my parents have constantly pushed out to me is like this framework, you know, I, I grew up with a black mom and a black dad and, and it was like, who, what, when, where, why, and how? And it was like, try again. I'm like, so I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna do this. And they're like, try again. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna work on X, Y, Z. And they're like, great. So, um, you know, when somebody, whether it's in one of my businesses or with art, like you said earlier, like there's not a right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, a, a thing that I feel like a lot of artists at some point will struggle with is looking at other people's art and being like, I can't do that, and it's not right. Arthur, I'm looking at your stuff, because I can't do that. Um, and, and so it's it's this big struggle, so I, I love that you say that, because my counterpart to that is I, I just don't hear no, and it's not an arrogance thing, because I've had that question. But in some way, you do. You need to have your own swag. you got to believe in yourself in your own way. you got to have your own ego. you got to have your own arrogance, and I say that there's the good ego and the bad ego. Yeah. And separating those, like having ego is really important. It just depends on the humility of it. Um, and when I when I ask that, I want you to tie, especially, because I don't know if y'all been by and seen this piece right here, but while he's been talking and the things he's saying, I, I'm seeing more and more in the piece. Sorry for y'all that can't see, it should have been here. Um, but when I, when I see this piece, first all I saw were these two people reaching out for each other and I was appreciating like the depiction of what I feel like is dreads in the thing and then I'm looking down and you're talking about European art and you're like, I still paint that a little bit. I was like, oh, I see it because it's like the statues from the Greekish times, but she got rolls and it's like thickish or is that a dude? But it's like not perfect, but it's perfect. And then I saw shackles, right? And I have a piece called 400 Years Later it's a, a, basically the story of my ancestors jumping instead of being enslaved. And it really came from me being in Wakanda, the, you know, for that little bit of time. And old boy talking about it. And I was like, and I researched it. And it kept sticking with me. And then, you know, there's jellyfish in there and these depictions of waves to reflect, like, what I feel like is the world keeps continuing. And our history has attempted to be erased several times. But orally, we always always keep it yep. so i would love for you to talk more about that piece yes i would love to so that piece is a, exactly about the elements of my child that i was speaking about this piece is titled orphaned ascension and it's about the orphaned aspect of the ascension of black and well black children together especially of boy and girl they don't want us to see that we need each other from that early on <laughs> Hold on, y'all take that in real quick. Right. Can we have a rewind? Like, yeah, same So systematically, this piece is about the fact that early on, from the time of birth, uh, when our children are born, they have these wings of expectation to fly and reach whatever they want to reach. The world places an expectation on them to tell them that they don't need each other. So mm -hmm. this piece is about the fact that the title of forfended ascension because this is a forfended, forfended relationship. Um, mm -hmm upbringing where boys and girls are always taught to grow up separately or boys do this, girls do that. No, what, why won't we work together or teach them together so that they learn relationship skills early on because this is what I'm having to learn as an adult now. And it's like, well, I don't need you here to really do that, but actually, like, you probably do need her here because you need a feminine take on what's going on. Right? You gotta have the feminine energy. Yes. You have to have yes. the masculine energy. Yes. And an, an, an exciting thing when you talk about that, like, boys do this, girls do this. Three favorite things about how, like, my, my nephew's being raised. Because, like, when we talk about kids and stuff, I always, like, go back to that. Like, his favorite color was rainbow, right? Like, that, that was his favorite color. And nobody was like, no, you can't do that, right? And then, and his favorite thing was, like, jumping and falling. And my sister's like, cool. The rule was when he fell, he had to get up and be like, I'm okay, yep. like verbally say it. Mm -hmm. And my sister, um, you know, she always talked about she wanted her son to have an IQ and an EQ, right? Mm -hmm. To emotionally be able to, to to share and not have what we teach boys, like toughen up, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, so so those are my favorite things, and, and I love this piece. I love it, I love it, I love it. Um, it what series is it out of? Uh, kind of. Look inside the inner turmoils of a black millennial mind. 
Mm. Mm. And the last question I have for you before we like end this and everybody can talk to the artist. Martha's in the house. Martha stepped up and really helped us curate today. She's one of the artists on the wall. And um, again, throughout this whole um, exhibition this week and the exhibit, please talk to the artists. We're here. We want to talk about our pieces. And, um, you know, some galleries you go to, European white-centric galleries, it's, it's, it's a different vibe. And so the vibe we want to bring everything in Melanin Minds is interactive, of love, of care. We ask all our artists at the bottom, like one of the only clause we have is, um, are you comfortable talking about your mental health journey? Mm -hmm. um, and we've appreciated your transparency. And my last question is, what is your black boy joy? Seeing other black boys joyful, honestly. Ooh, ish. I love see us all thriving and doing things that we want to see come to fruition and being the catalyst of all of those dreams that we've had is what I have as a dream come true. So honestly, just to continue that at a greater scale is my and biggest, Amplify, yeah, amplify, amplify. Yeah. And you're doing that right here on the south side of Chicago. Um, you're not only a beautiful artist on canvas and with oils and originally uh, with uh, acrylics. You know I about that. Um, but you're doing murals. Yes. Will you talk a little bit about your organization and what the projects you're working on? Yes. So I have, have the pleasure of working with a nonprofit uh, with my best friend, uh, Barrett Keekley. Uh, he started a nonprofit titled Paint the City. Uh, it started in the heat of the George Floyd protests. Uh, I'd like to say protests instead of rioting because there was no riot. There was no riot. There was no riot. There was a reason. Just like he didn't die, he was exactly. murdered. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, absolutely. <laughs> so we began doing beautification projects uh, when we saw these boards and all the stuff everywhere. So we were like, oh, we could get out and knock out some of those. And then it turned into a pan like a, a pandemic of that, where it was like, everybody needs them. Everybody needs them. Everybody is putting them up. And they have to be painted. They, we, and we want to put our representation on the city. We want to put what we look like around instead of them bringing people from any and that anywhere, or just having the city looking like it was abandoned, because that's what they would do, and have us walking around, and then they would make us feel as though this was a result of what we did. Uh, so we started that, and that actually blew up nationwide. So now we actually travel to the murals. We uh, beautify both the south and west sides of Chicago, uh, predominantly black and brown neighborhoods, and we focus primarily on connecting black and brown artists to black and brown businesses to build those uh, local and international relationships to make sure that black artists are receiving business and what they actually do. I love that. Well, we at Melanin Minds look forward to figuring out a partnership with y'all and supporting y'all, and even if it's cross-promotion and amplification. Um, we appreciate your time. We appreciate you being here, you. believing in the Melanin Minds mental health journey in general. And um, y'all, that's our talk back for this evening with Blake. And uh, stick around, get some wine, talk to the artists. And we're going to be here all weekend. Again, shout out to Connect Gallery for opening their doors. To Martha, to Dana Todd Pope, to I call her A London, but Angelica, to Blake, to Arthur, all these beautiful walls, Pigment Magazine, pick one up, view it, uh, and we'll be here all weekend. So cool. All right, thanks, y'all. Thank Bye. Yes. Thank you. That was dope. <laughs> so I can drop it. Yes, ma'am.